in uh, this uh, YouTube video, what I want to show you is how to do an adsorption isotherm and explain parts of what that adsorption isotherm means. Um, to start with, what we need to do is think about the information we have in the soil um, and how we want to start considering adsorption. And so adsorption, right, means something's in a solution, in an, an ion, or it doesn't need to be an ion, it can be anything, and how it sticks to a solid. So in order to define that system, what we need to think of are what solid is present and the solution conditions that affect that ion and the solid, um, right? The solid can have protonation reactions happening on the surface. Um, those are pH dependent, so it's going to matter of what pH the system is. As well, the ions can be protonated or deprotonated or have different forms in solution as a function of pH. Um, so what we need to do is start by specifying all the information we have about the system. So to do that, for the problem that we had, we were going to define lead adsorption in a soil um, as a function of constant, uh, a bunch of information. And so I gave you information from a real place that I was recently asked to give information about where the soil pH was 7.2. So I'm going to put in the 7.2 there. And then I said the real density of the soil, the, what's called the bulk density, is tells us how much solid is in the soil. Um, all the inputs in this case are given in per liter. So if the bulk density is 1.4 grams per centimeter cubed, that means there's 1.4 kilograms of solid in one liter of solution. So what we need are total system. So that means if we have a certain concentration, that means we need to do some simple math, right? So to figure out exactly what's going on. And so if we had, for example, the concentration of lead um, is 1,794 milligrams per kilogram, right? So, but that concentration of lead is per kilogram of soil, not per liter. So if we want to get it into per liter, we need to multiply by 1.4 kilograms per liter. Okay, and so one, that means 1794 times 1 1.4 equals 2,511. So if we want to make sure our concentration of lead, we've got to put in PB at that concentration. So I'm going to, oops, it's chromium, not lead. So I go down here and I get to the lead, PB2+, plus, and I change the concentration unit to milligrams per liter. And milligrams per liter, that was 2,512. Okay, so then I say add to list. So that's the amount of lead. Similarly, I know how much phosphorus is in the system. It was 989 times 1.4, and that is 1,385. So if I want to put in phosphorus, I'll put in the total amount of phosphorus as 1,385 milligrams per liter. Okay, now in the case of iron, we can put in an iron phase. Um, in our case, in this, what we're really in, we want to sort of we can put it in here as a solid as a component. But really, the reason we care about iron in this case is we want to study how it could cause adsorption or precipitation. Um, so rather than put it in as a component here, what we want it, what I'm going to do is say, well, we could add it here. But for the most part, the amount we add here isn't going to be so inc incredibly important. Um, instead, what I want to do is add iron instead of as a component this way through the adsorption module. Adsorption up here at the top, which I just clicked on the tab, is a, shows surface complexation reactions and adsorption isotherms um, there, and it allows us to account for adsorption. Um, one of the things that's really powerful about this program is someone, many, many, many people, in fact, have gone through the painstaking um, work of looking for and identifying research in, that's been published and finding these equilibrium constants for adsorption. So there's already a lot of information out there. And if we actually, I'm going to quit and erase. If we go up here to adsorption and specify surface complexation reactions, we'll be able to describe it. We could also specify adsorption isotherms which if you see, if you clicked on it, you could say, for example, I think it will be a Freundlich or a K2 
KD or other kinds of things, and you can see an equation, you can see the constants that are in that equation and so forth. Um, and this is a way of doing these. Um, turns out that that is, you know, those are things that are just parameterized. They're not actual kind of official adsorption reactions, so it's hard to do an equilibrium constant for them. Uh, and we can do surface complexation reactions, which actually describes real equilibrium constants. And so to do that, we specify a surface complexation reaction. And this allows us to have more than a complicated system. So you could have, for example, iron oxide and manganese oxide, or you could have different kinds of solids that things could react with. But um, in our case, each solid would be an, a surface. So if we just specify a number of surfaces one, what that says is we're gonna allow one kind of surface to be present, or one set of surfaces for one mineral phase. And then the adsorption model type here, you can see a lot of different um, types. So there are, is this one HFO, that's hydrospheric oxide. There's gibbsite, which is aluminum hydroxide. There's goethite, which is FeOOH. There's ferrihydrite CDM, um, which is a Zombach and Morel model. Um, there's a version for calcite that was recently added. Um, so fixed charge site and all these things at the top. Const CCM or constants capacitance model for two pKa's. What that says basically is the surface can have two protonation deprotonation reactions um, and so forth. And so the TLM is triple layer model, DLM is double layer model, which allows for both covalent bonds on the surface and, and ionic bonds or weak, weaker long range charge based bonding as well further from the surface and um, and so forth. So in our case, what I told you to use is this triple layer model. Um, that this one for HFO is hydro for iron oxide is also potentially useful. Um, but in this case, we click on this one. What you can see now is you get a lot of information. And so what we would want to do is think about all that information that we have to put in. And so if we were to put in the solid concentration and what we, you know, the first thing is the amount of solid. And we know in the case of iron, there's plenty of iron around. The problem specified 0.9% weight per weight iron, which means there's 9,000 milligrams per kilogram of iron. 9,000 milligrams per kilogram if we times by 1.4 again to get, that's 12,600 grams of per liter of iron. Okay, so about one and something percent. Mm -hmm. And we could, you know, so that's a, a typical kind of number. Now, if we put in a smaller amount of iron um, as a way of looking at it, we can see how to do things. And so if we specify our solid, can see you have to specify surface area we have to specify capacitance 15 outer capacitance 0.2 site concentration so we could put in all of these things right if you notice in this case you'd need a whole bunch of parameters now what's handy is in this case so those would all be in real life what you would do is you would do an absorption experiment and then you would use this equate the set of equations that describes this kind of model and you would fit these as very as constants to determine what those constants are um, these are pretty realistic numbers for these um, however what i'm going to suggest is we use a different kind of solid so if we do surface complexation reaction we do one specify this one HFO. The beauty of this one is everything else is sort of in there and I'll show you how this works. So if I put in now a solid concentration of 6.4 grams per liter, it has a surface area, etc. I hit OK. So if I click on this FEO DLM 2008, this has now that database that that, that version of that of the is using um, 
So you can see it's using a diffuse layer model. It's using all of the chemical reactions for the formation of these adsorptions. So it has literally you know, hundreds of equations in it. Of course, most of those don't have iron or phosphorus and since ours are lead. So our, mostly what we're looking at are the ones here with iron adsorbed with lead and, for example, the phosphate ones here. So what we're just doing is basically using the existing database at a certain concentration. And if we hit save, what's going to happen is now we're in a position where we can run the model. If we say, because we've specified now the amount of things, the phosphate and the lead in solution, we gave it an amount of solid and we said specified the pH. And if we hit run, we get an idea of what's going on. So here, here's the data that we get as output. Now, just like the other examples we've seen, the species distribution looks complicated because everything that's possible is there. So we see there are concentrations of iron of the different kinds of surface species that there are. Because remember, some of them have nothing on them. They don't have lead or they have, and they have no iron, or sorry, they have no lead or phosphate. But others have phosphates. For example, there's five of them, six of them there that have phosphate adsorbed. There's one, two that have lead. Right, we have surface charges here in terms of strong and protonated sites. We have the concentration of things in solution, which includes the phosphorus, you know, because phosphoric acid is a has a a couple of PKAs. Then we see the lead speciation also can be there, and so and so forth. If we look at the saturation index, so we did not allow a mineral to precipitate first in this case, you can see some minerals would super, super, super like to precipitate if, according to this system. 18 mag orders of magnitude supersaturated with respect to lead 3 phosphate 2, a lead phosphate solid that could form. Okay. Um, hydroxyl pyromorphite, even more under oversaturated. So those tell us what could form because we didn't allow anything to form. Now we can see the mass distribution. If we look at the mass distribution, we see that there are some dissolved and some precipitated here, depending on our condition. Okay, so what we want to try to do is what we, we could do is change the conditions here and look at how things happen and look at our concentrations of dissolved things and under different kinds of conditions and see what the, how that system would change. Okay. So that is a simple system. If we wanted to allow a mineral to precipitate, for example, I would say here's, you know, it'll tell us the ones that are, you know, there's a bazillion that are in here, but only some of them are, have the components we have. So most of these, of course, don't apply to us. It would be really handy if it only plotted the ones that are possible so that we don't have to have trouble finding them. But let's just use this one here, lead phosphate solid which has a certain equilibrium constant for, for being precipitated, um, ten, minus log K SP of minus 43, which means very insoluble, right? We hit add, so it actually gets put on the list, and then we run it again. And so now that with a possible solid, we have potentially an amount of solid formed, right? You can see this amount of solid. And now if we look at mass distribution, you can see that much of the solid is the lead, and very much less is adsorbed, but still some, and essentially now the concentration in solution is very small. So the amount of, if we allow a solid to form, would do something good for us, right? We've all hopefully seen some of this before um, in our presentations. So what we want to do now is use this information to solve how we go about thinking about about lead in solution and how to get something like a lead phosphate to actually form. And so the way we want to think about potentially doing this is to quantify different forms of things as a function of pH. Um, in order to solve your problems, what you will want to do is solve these conditions here with, an, with a solid forming and without to think about um, and so what you want to keep in mind is if you will, if a possible solid forms, it will form all the way to equilibrium. But if we don't think that's complete, what we might want to do is make sure we remove the possible solid from our calculation, at least initially. 
right? And then what we would we could do is we go up here to sweep. And this sweep here allows us to, for example, measure different things as a function of whatever we want. So if we want to change things as a function of pH, and we want to let's we want to range things over certain ranges, we could go from two, we could increase every 0 0.1, and we, if we do 100 problems, each one, so it would go pH 2, it would do the calculation, then it would go to pH 2.1 because our increment between values is 0.1, and then it would go to 2.2, and each time it does it, and it would do it 100 times, so if it does that, it would end up at a pH much higher than 2, right? 2 to 12, okay? And then what we can do is tell it which pieces of output we want it to collect from each one of those ex experiments, right? And so for one, we could say the amount of phosphorus, if we want to think of it, we could say the, we could say total absorbed, the total amount of adsorbed, the total amount of dissolved phosphorus in solution, right? And we could specify lead, okay? And we could say the total absorbed, again, and the total dissolved. That those are different from specific lead two plus or lead or phosphate in to, as an ion because there are many forms of phosphorus phosphates that are in solution, right? The protonated species and ion pairs and such, and how these fit together um, is a bit more complicated. We could also calculate specific ion concentrations. If we want to know the specific ion concentration, we could just say lead 2 plus. And if now, because we have both of those in there as different outputs, we'll see both of them. Or specific forms of, for example, if we wanted to see this one, we'll do all of the forms of phosphoric acid, right, just to show how all of them are. So then we'll do... So we haven't added phosphate by itself as a concentration yet. So that gives us the form of specific forms of lead and specific phosphate concentrations. Okay, so if we hit this now and we hit save and back, if we run it, what we're going to get is a problem where we get a whole bunch of data as, at each pH. And this kind of information here is going to be actually what we use to solve our problems. And so how these pieces of data fit together, this is basically um, what your problem set will be. But as an example here, we look at pH 2, and then it gives us each one of those columns, right? You see, at pH 2, sorbed is still greater than, for phosphorus, dissolved. For lead, sorbed is much less than dissolved. So you see that they have different relationships with pH. You see that the concentration of dissolved in, in that specific PB2 cation, at least at pH 2, is almost exactly the same. But if we were to go up to, for example, other conditions, you see one is very different from the other. Okay? So it depends on the pH. This right here, this example, is pH 10.3. So you can see that in some cases, the total amount in solution is it's mostly lead 2 plus at interacidic conditions, but under basic conditions, it's definitely not the case. Phosphoric, the specific phosphorus concentrations also vary according to pH and can vary significantly from the total dissolved, right? Only one of them could be a major species of the total dissolved, okay? So you get all this output. The beauty now is if we print to Excel, right, we can open up Excel and then it will tell us all that information in the spreadsheet, and we could calculate the concentrations of various things over, over pH. So you're going to do that in your problem set and make use of that, okay? So um, that concludes this tutorial, at least for now, and uh, hopefully it was useful.